uh, podcast. I promised you uh, in the previous episode at the beginning that we would move on into Romans 8, and that is my intention. What I want to do with this episode, as you can tell by the title, I want to just kind of get us to the point where we can actually get into those things and move on from these first four verses. Now, they're going to always play into what we say from now on, but I I think kind of gathering everything that we've said in previous episodes up and especially focusing on the reality of covenant, the reality of God's power and sufficiency up against the the weakness, the infirmity of the earthen vessel in whom he lives is a very important point. And we need to focus on that, I think, to proceed because I want us to understand there is a reality that governs. There is a reality that holds us. There is a reality in which we abide due to the fact that he abides in us. And so with that in mind, I wanted to do this episode or just post this. I I recorded this. It's about an hour and 30-minute teaching, and I recorded it about a day or two ago, and I just felt like it would be a good presentation to uh, allow you to listen to, to just bring everything together, bring everything that we've said, everything that we've talked about in the last few episodes, just bring it together in one episode so that we could move on into the next verses of chapter 8 because this is very important for us to keep in mind as the basis for where we're going as the basis upon which everything else Paul is going to say uh, rests. So let me just share this with you during this time, and then in our next episode we will move on and get into some areas that may be challenging for us that has to do with the context of this letter. Understanding that will, I think, alleviate a lot of the confusion that we have had when attempting to understand these next verses in Romans chapter 8. So uh, I hope you enjoy this session. Thanks, guys. We're uh, in this class. We are still concentrating on the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters in Romans. Uh, you may hear some wind blowing out there. We're having a pretty severe windstorm today. Um, and we've been in chapter 8 for some time now, and basically the first four verses of chapter 8 for some time. And everything that we've been talking about has stemmed from that particular section of chapter 8. <clears throat> we have been looking at many different aspects of, of that, that are addressed in these chapters. We've been speaking, chapter 8 of Romans brought us into Galatians 2 and 3, where we saw Paul confront Peter for his hypocrisy in front of the Gentile believers who had been taught by Paul and taught by Peter, apparently himself, that the external uh, ceremonies, the external restrictions of the law of Moses had been realized and had been what they testified of, the thing that those restrictions were actually a picture of, which was basically a nature a man, a kind, a seed who would not give himself to mixture, would not partake of things that were unclean, 
whose nature was perfection and holy and righteous. It was not to perpetually keep that standard in the external. It was an external picture for a time to be internally fulfilled in the coming of a spiritual reality, a spiritual substance. And Peter, when he backs away from the uh, Gentile believers in Antioch, And he backs away from them showing or implying by his action that the externalities of the law were still in effect and still had validity and weight. Paul calls that hypocrisy because he was covering up the reality by masking it with the illusion of a valid ceremony. And Paul, knowing what that hypocrisy would do to these believers, had to confront Peter to his face. And he begins to declare to to Peter, but in front of everyone there, that Peter and Paul, who had the law, who were under the law of Moses, and who perfectly adhered to it, believing that in it they would find righteousness and find holiness and find perfection, had to come to believe in another. By faith, they had to receive Christ so that the righteousness they attempted to achieve under the law could actually come into their soul and achieve everything in them the law demanded. Showing the dependence of the soul to receive the superseding and substantial life of the spirit. To be in any way a partaker of the reality that the law of Moses declared in testimony. And in types and shadows and figures. And he does all of that, and in the midst of it all, showing how Christ himself is the righteousness that those things testified of. Those things are no longer valid. And to go back to those things actually, after having come to the substance in Christ, is actually a true breaking of or transgression of the law itself. Because the law itself, as he says in Romans 7, was spiritual, meaning it had a spiritual intention and a spiritual conclusion. It could never be realized or brought to conclusion in flesh and blood, external actions, commandments, no matter how well they were obeyed or how perfectly they were adhered to. Flesh and blood would never. That's the weakness of the law. The flesh and blood could never be empowered enough to bring it about. God, in his infinite wisdom, was the architecture of a system that testified of a reality that only he could bring to a conclusion. That only he could bring about. That only he could make real and and be the reality of. And that's what I want to talk about during this time. And that's why it is so important to understand that the end of chapter 2 is still him declaring this in the midst of the Gentiles in front of Peter and saying, here's the point, Peter. Here's the point, Gentiles. Here's what I have found. That it is by the law that I am not righteous and holy, but the law itself brought me to a conclusive end, brought me to my end, brought me to all things concluded in one man, that I may be dead to the very thing that held me in bondage to sin and death, and in the coming of this perfect life, receive in that life the life promised, the abundant life that Christ came to bring. And in that life, I have found the righteousness of God, the right standing with God. Because that is what the grace of God has wrought. 
And if it is not, then Christ died in vain. We could do it otherwise. We did not have to receive his life, his spirit as the doing, the performance, the full filling of the thing the law demanded. By the law, I am dead to the law. It brought me to its conclusion. It was a schoolmaster to bring me to the conclusive object. And I came through the door into that one perfect man. And as one found in him, I am dead to all else. I am dead to the law because I am dead to the man in him. In him now, I am dead to the other man, the the seed of corruption, that Adamic man. I'm dead to that. I am now freed from the thing that held me. I am no longer in bondage as a slave to sin and death. Now I have been captured and now am the slave of righteousness himself. He is made unto me. That's That's a definite thing. It is not proposing something. It is declaring who he is presently in you, giving you no choice in the matter if you have received him. He is made unto you this reality. I am crucified with Christ. That means crucified to everything. This is not a process of dying to self. It is being dead to sin, dead with Christ to corruption, dead to it all. And having no life but him, yet I live. But that I there is not there. It is there is now life, but it is not I. It is Christ who liveth in me. And this life I live every day is not trying to give weight to the things I've counted lost. It's not trying to find in my flesh or the externalities of my being the righteousness of God? No. The grace of God has given that righteousness to me as a gift. I live daily by faith. A faith that is apprehending the Son as my very life, as my very righteousness, as all things in the sight of God perfect. I am accessing and apprehending Him. Laying hold and putting all dependence and trust in that perfect seed who is now in me. And have no confidence as you are now implying you do, Peter. No confidence in the flesh. And this goes into so many areas of scripture. So many areas. Galatians uh, three, and that's why he goes into it now by saying, so now Galatians, who's bewitched you? Who's bewitched you? Who has bewitched you to not rest assured by faith in this grace in which you stand? The grace that is provided, not I, but Christ. He lives, not me. He is righteous, not me. He is all, not me. He is all in me, but he is not In me to make me anything. He is the all in me because I have no hope of anything otherwise. That is sufficiency. It leaves all the variables out. It removes them all. Men speculate upon the variables. God reveals the absolutes. Because that's all that exists in reality. Christianity is built upon and thrives upon conjecture. Your salvation rests upon the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because that's who he is in you right now. And yes, there is a great understanding That must come in that, in the seeing of that one. But that doesn't make him any more than he already is. It does not uh, uh, solidify the condition of your soul any more than it already is. From the moment you were born of God. It makes your soul aware of what already is. 
that you may live in accordance in the enjoyment and the true appreciation to God for what he has wrought. Oh, absolutely. That is necessary. But there is a true, how can we say it, danger in having anything of our salvation rest Upon our understanding. To build the edifice. Upon our knowing and our knowledge. And our comprehension. You can't build anything upon that. No. Because our understanding changes. From day to day to day. As we see him. As God makes him known. Our understanding. I know mine does. My understanding changes. Now the reality I am understanding never does. But my understanding of that reality changes. becomes clearer. Some things are put out. Some things come in brand new and a greater focus. Understanding is a variable that is dictated in the seeing of Jesus Christ. But where should reality rest? Where should the true edifice of our salvation be? be, uh, What what is the premise of it all? Upon what does it stand? An understanding that is variable variates and has variations and grows and comes changes from day to day or does the reality rest upon him who is the foundation the rock who is the same yesterday today and forever the one that never changes the one that always is the I am This is what we're addressing. Having received the spirit, Paul would say to them, is there something more that is necessary that you will add to this? Is there a subsequent thing that has to come to make it more perfect than it is, to make it more real than it is? It is real in you if he is in you. We'll talk about that as we go. But I want you to see something based upon this confrontation, based upon what he'll go into in chapter 3 of Galatians when he says, here's the deal, guys. Was this by your work or was this by the faith that you had in his? Was this something that came by your performance under the law? You qualified for it and God gave you his spirit? Or... Did you receive the spirit by faith? It's kind of the same thing he says in Galatians chapter 4. Where he will say to them. This is the seal of your sonship. The King James says. Because you are sons. God has given the spirit of his son in you crying Abba Father. But here's the true rendering of that. And you can look it up. I've studied it out in many different word studies. Many different commentaries. And it, is, it should be worded this way. Here is the seal of your sonship. This is what seals it for you. This is what is actually the confirming that you are a son. God has given you the spirit of his son. What does that mean? It's the end of all debate. The presence of the spirit of the son is the end of every conjecture. It is the moment when everything intended for your soul comes to your soul. And brings it in fullness. This is what seals the deal. Your sonship is not determined by actions. It is determined by presence. Presence. Now, let's let's go on for a second. So he gets into these areas of Abraham believed God. And we'll see in a moment why. That was his only... That was the only tool in his tool chest, faith. That's the only one that would work. In the light of the promise, in the light of everything God said, in the light of what God determined would be and what God declared to him would be, the only tool that was effective in any of it 
was faith. We know what he tried, Abraham tried to do and actually did something, but did nothing at the same time. Because he did something, he had, with Hagar's assistance, he had Ishmael. But that did nothing toward the progressing of the promise made by God. Because again, God orchestrated it to where the only way the promise that he made could be brought about was by his own power. That's what I want to talk about today because this goes into what we've been saying in Romans 8 that God did all that he did, sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Receiving the life of this man who's put away sin, who's put away death, who put all of that away and could bring us from that condition into an altogether new condition determined by his very life. Present within. This is what we're saying. The righteousness of the law fulfilled, brought to completion, performed fully in us, not by us. Because we had no hope of ever having that as part of our capacity. We did not have any strength in this. And these are, this is the reason That Paul, and, and this gets into what we've been saying in Galatians 3 and all of that. and he, Now Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And we're going to read Romans 4 in a little bit and talk about the same thing. And he can go into this and saying, Knowing therefore they which are of faith are the children of Abraham. That's a big statement in the context he's writing it, in the time in which he is pinning these words. That's a huge statement. Totally disregarding those born of the natural lineage of Abraham and who boasted in Abraham as their own father. And you're saying that it's those who are of faith. That was what it was all about? Yes, because it was faith in a in the seed and it was faith in the seed that would come by the power of God and not the power of Abraham or his wife. That's what it was all about. And it was all encompassed within the reality of a covenant. And we're going to, we're going to see that covenant in a picture and show how it's presented here in these very, very, and, and basically governs the whole thing. It governs everything. And that's why, when we hear and we read of a new covenant, we have to understand the new covenant is not new in that it is God's second attempt. It is new in that it has brought something altogether new into reality, into existence that wasn't before. It's the very thing that Jesus says, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's the reality of the new covenant is the abundant life. Which if you take his statement there in John chapter 10 and you bring it over and compare it to Romans chapter 5 when Paul says where sin abounded, the grace of God has much more abounded. That grace that abounds is the life abundant that Christ has brought. Because in that life is this gift of grace that has provided in the soul to the soul. In an internal reality, sufficient grace that has bestowed in itself a life that has all spiritual blessings embodied in it. Everything of life and godliness bound up in that gift of God to the soul, the very person of his beloved son. And this is why 
Paul can make statements throughout these, his letters and others can make their statements of absolutes that we skip over and even argue with at times because he can say you are complete in him. That those who have Christ in them who is the hope of glory, we preach this to them that we may present to them that in Christ, in the Messiah, they have come to the goal. They have come to the fullness. They have come to something perfect that cannot be added to but can only be comprehended in the seeing of the perfection that he is. And men will come to you and they'll bring all of their all of their conceptions and they'll bring all of their methodologies and they'll bring all of their doctrines and they'll try to sway you and convince you that you don't have everything quite yet. You have to be a part of this thing or, or give your attention to this thing or incline yourself toward this operation and this method to actually bring to completion something God has already completed and has gifted to your soul in the presence of Christ. Do not be bewitched by these additions, by men who are puffed up in the vanity of their own imaginations. Because I'm telling you, and what we're going to address here, is that the reality of your salvation does not lend itself to the puffing up of your flesh. It does not lend itself to self-gratification, to self-exaltation, and to self-righteousness. The reality I'm addressing leaves no room for that type of boasting and removes all ground for the glorying in ourselves. But only in the one who has made all of this not only possible, but has fully performed it in us by the person of his Son, being in us, in grace, through grace. And we have been given the spirit that we may know these gracious realities, the gracious gift of God that has been freely given unto us in Christ. What I cannot see, ear cannot hear, and this mind will never conceive. Because we are always and at all times, when we were in Adam, in sin, in death, under the dominion of an inward government, a kingdom of darkness, we were dependent upon the coming of life. We were dependent upon a work that only God could do. And that work is a complete work. If we are born again, he has done something completely and fully, leaving no room for anything else necessary. There's no necessary thing added to it. Nothing needs to be added. You are complete in him. How can he make those statements? Because Paul is making these statements in the light of a covenant made. See, that's why the new covenant is written in you. It is written in your heart because the new covenant is that very life promise, that abounding life in whom it, it, that, that has within itself, bound up in itself, every spiritual blessing, every divine reality. It is the giving of that life that is the very covenant made with a soul, written in us. Not taking us externally by the hand and leading us around, but being in us the fulfilling of everything. The comprehensive reality of spirit and truth. This is the power and reality of the covenant that is confirmed and realized in Christ himself. And it's in the light of that 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 Paul confronts Peter. Because if you'll see these verses, and there's many other verses throughout his letters, but here, look at this. This is chapter 2 of Galatians, and this is in the midst of his confrontation with, uh, with Peter. Um, verse 15, we who are Jews by nature, that means born a natural Jew, having the law as our standard, and we're not sinners of the Gentiles, that means those who did not have a law 
of righteousness as their standard of living, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Even we. Did you hear that? That takes you right back to Romans 3, doesn't it? Paul understood that being a Jew in the flesh gave him no true boastable advantage. Yeah, they had the law. He says that. They had all of these things given to them of God, but it was not so they could boast in them forever, but so that those things to those people first, to the Jew first, could be received in the person of Christ. Without that consummation happening, those things were nothing. That's why after Romans 8 that we're going to end in Romans 8, after that he says, my hope for them is that they would be saved. Listen to that. Because he knew that being saved was when all of this took place. Being born again, that they would come to receive the very thing they were intended for. Because it was to them that was given the covenants and the adoption and the glory. And whom, to whom were the fathers. And it was all for them first. And they refused him, therefore they refused everything. How would they receive it? Salvation. And that's what's bound up in these words in front of Peter and that tells them the same thing. They needed Jesus just like the Gentiles. They did not have a special relationship with God that the Gentiles didn't. They didn't have some special dispensation before God because they had the law of Moses. No. The law of Moses was not some special thing. It was to bring them to the special thing, to the full reality. The same full reality the Gentiles now possessed by birth, new birth, by faith. He gets into that. Paul does in Romans, uh, part of uh, the end of that the that the Gentiles who had no law, they've received the righteousness of God by faith, and those who sought it by the law haven't received it. Same argument here. The dependence was receiving life, receiving grace, receiving all things as a dependent soul upon the power of another. A soul dependent fully upon the power and performing of another within. Something we could never do and do in ourselves. Listen to these words. Knowing, verse 16 of Galatians 2. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we, Peter, have believed in Jesus. So that we might be justified, that means righteous, made righteous or just, by faith, by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. None. This is, I mean, this is his Jesus statement to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why? Because what you do in the flesh... That which is of the flesh is flesh. It goes no further than that, proceeds beyond that in no way. No matter how good it looks, how great it is, proceeds no further than that is flesh. That which is spirit. Because being born again is what brings you from the one to the other, flesh to spirit. We're going to talk about that later in these next verses in chapter 8. And many have debated this. It's been a confusing Verses. Those have been confusing verses for many. But it's the very same thing. Unless you're born again, you're in the flesh. And you can have nothing but the fruit of the flesh. Being born of the Spirit, Spirit is now present. Spirit is now the condition of the soul. Not you becoming Spirit, but the Spirit now determining the condition of your soul 
and con, uh, determining the reality that is in your soul. Not just the condition of your soul, but what your soul now possesses as a gift. All blessings, all fullness, all of it. And all that he has given in the spirit is unfortunately the things that we still seek after in religion. What we try to attain. But we try to attain what we suppose those things are. Because we all have given them external semblance, external appearance. Reality is Christ. And you can only see the nature of that reality when you see Christ. Look at these words. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but only by the faith of Christ. What is that statement Present hopelessness. Peter, you know. You know that even though we had these external things that gave us a feeling of righteousness, gave us an assumption of holiness, that gave us a feeling in ourselves that we were doing God's work and in relationship with God. We mocked these for being sinners. We called them dogs. We mocked them. We thought we had an upper hand, a higher level, a higher elevation. We were in a higher place. Remember those who brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus? We've already talked about that. Having an air of superiority over her because of their religion, because of the externalities that they were involved in were better than hers. But guess what? He brings them all in the same inward category of dead sin corruption. You must be born again. And that's what Paul is presenting. Peter, you know, as good as it looked, and as much as we supposed we had righteousness because of it, Even we, for righteousness to actually come and be a reality in us, even we had to believe in Jesus Christ. We had to receive him. We had to receive that life, that grace in which is bestowed every spiritual blessing. Even we, nothing else could do it. Hopelessness until he comes. A hopeless state. Helpless until we believed in him and received him as everything we thought we could achieve. And if it was to be possible at all, it was solely by faith. Could not be the product of our effort and our ability, our adherence and our observation. So that brings us here. Romans chapter 4. Because chapter 3 of Romans, although it gives you the answer at the end of chapter 3, it begins by showing you this hopeless, hopeless state. And he encapsulated within that hopelessness both Jew and Gentile. They had no advantage at all because of an inward condition of sin and death, always constantly missing the mark. And could not do otherwise ever on his best day. Hopeless. What did God do? He sent his son. This chapter is consolidated in one verse. Romans chapter 8. Or two verses. Romans chapter 8 verses 3 and 4. The whole chapter 3 is brought to a conclusive statement. Chapter 8 verse 3 and 4. Read it together. Read it together. Because it shows God sending his son to that which is falls short 
of the glory. God gave the law to that. Yes. For a couple of reasons. So that the sin that they were under could be known to be exceedingly sinful. Meaning a hopeless situation they were in. And they couldn't get themselves out of it because they were slaves. You don't have a choice when you're a slave. You don't make the choice to get out. And decide, well, I don't think I'm going to be a slave today. Another with greater power has to come and deliver you. And he delivers you by death to the thing. What? Why is that important? Because it doesn't just bring you from the one to the other. It is a work of the cross. It is the work of the death of the cross. Death, burial, and resurrection. Because Dying to that thing means that thing can never, ever, ever have hold upon you again. It can never claim you again because you're dead to it. That's being made free and not set free. Whom the Son makes free. Knowing the truth is true shall make you free. Who he makes free is free indeed. Not just sets you free so the cage is still there for you to return. But makes you free in that you couldn't return to it because it's not there to return to. You're dead to it. That's a work wrought. That's a finished work. Into which your soul comes by being born of another seed. That's when you truly Are dead to it. That's when your soul is dead to it. Not just something he did 2,000 years ago to make it so. But you become a partaker in what he made so. And is the reality of when you are born of his seed. That means be indwelt by his life. Because the one who is dead to it now becomes your life. That means through him you are as one joined to him. Dead to the thing he's dead to and alive unto God through him. There's a recognition of that, Paul says, that must come into the soul. But that is the reality of the soul when you are born again. Beautiful reality. Beautiful reality. So verse 4, chapter 4 of Romans Verse 3. Well, let's start in verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? What has he found in the flesh? If Abraham were justified by works, he would have a ground or a reason whereof to glory, but not before God. You can glory all you want. Not in the sight of God if there's no valid ground to boast and glory at all. But what did the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh. Listen to these words because I want you to really focus on this. Because I'm going to tell you something that may make you mad or may make you happy. I don't know. It may liberate you or it may really tick you off. Um, You'll have to be the judge of that. But it's based upon this. I want you to hear these words because I want to show you something in Genesis. Looking at this very place where it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now. To him, verse 4, to him that worketh, performs, it is is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. That means it is owed to you because you have achieved something warranting compensation. You had an ability to do something that warranted compensation. So someone was now in debt to you because of your performance or your work, and they now owed you something and they paid you what they owed you and that's how most of Christianity functions God gave you this by grace but the other you work for and you achieve 
He gives you the power to achieve. That's how good he is. But you, it's up to you to actually do it and, and qualify for these levels. All right, verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Listen to that. Just hear those words. Him that worketh not. That seems so contradictory to Christian living. That seems so contradictory to being a sold out believer in Jesus. What do you mean worketh not? What do you mean? You mean indifferent and uncommitted and all of that? No. Most of us don't understand that when we use words like this, we mean vertically, right? And I use that not to not because that's not the reality of it. I'm using vertical saying from us to him. What is up, up from us to God? What is recognized for, up by God that has anything to do with us? That's what I'm talking about. Because when we're going to talk about in this class, at, as we go, and we're almost to the end of it, weakness. Incapacity, infirmity, barrenness. These are things, these are words associated with this picture of Abraham and why he believed God and his faith toward God and God performing the thing. It all had to do with barrenness. Read this chapter. It's all about weakness and barrenness. This is why Paul would say, in my weakness I am strong. Why? Not because he makes me strong when I'm weak. No, he is the strength in the midst of weakness. Not I, but Christ. That's what governs that statement. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Not the absence of the issue. Not the absence of the thorn. But the sufficiency of an internal reality called grace. That is so sufficient that you, Paul, can glory and boast in your weakness. Why? Because you're boasting in your, in, in, in your inability. No, you don't glory in that. No, no, no. You would glory in the fact that he is the superseding sufficient power that overcomes all weakness in yourself. That the earthen vessel that you are is indwelt by an exceeding power called the treasure himself. So that everything of your salvation would be known to be of him and not of you. That's the whole point. Your weakness and your glorying in weakness is about glorying in his sufficiency in the midst of it and, and, and realizing in this vertical relationship where it's me to God that there is nothing of you that he desires. There is nothing from you that he's expecting. Everything he has expected, he has provided and he makes it known in you. He does this. I will glory in my weakness. And I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that as we go. He believed God to those who worketh not. But look at it. Believed on him that justifieth the ungodly. That's a, that's a weird, weird way of saying it, right? Justifieth the ungodly. We don't think that way, right? We don't think in the terms of Paul saying, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we were without strength, he did this. Why? Because we don't understand the reality of the covenant of God. The new covenant or the old covenant. The old covenant was the same, but the new covenant is much greater because it is an internal thing. Not just an external testimony, but an internal fulfillment. An internal reality where we can actually boast. In the insufficiency that we possess in and of ourselves. Because we know that he has wrought a work and made Christ to be unto us all things. So in our weakness, he is sufficient. In our nothingness, he is all. In our incapacity, he is sufficient. By grace you are saved and not of yourself. It is the gift of God wonderful gift that most 
overlook. So let's take this. Because we're going to, I want to come more into this because this verse 6, even as David described the blessedness of the man into whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's Romans 8, 4. He imputed it. Again, imputed is you have non-sufficient funds. Someone who has sufficient funds gives. He doesn't lend it to you. Gives you. He doesn't give you a job so you can work for the funds. He gives you the funds. He gives you the sufficient funds. And that overcomes your innate condition of insufficient funds. He overcomes it by his own capacity, his own ability. You couldn't do it, he did it. This is covenant. This is the reality of covenant. Because Christianity today lives in the illusion of contract and not covenant. We are preached the salvation by contract, meaning God saves you and now you uphold your end. Because a contract is made between two parties who both have equal capacity to hold up their end of the bargain. So when one does not and fails to do it, there's a breach of contract. So we're taught in Christianity that we have a contract And that God is making us equal parties so we can hold up our end and he holds up his end. If you don't hold up his end, he won't hold up his end. Wow. I had a man tell me one time. He was reprimanding me in his office, a pastor. And uh, a pastor that I had. And he was reprimanding me for something that I was preaching concerning the finished work. And he said, it doesn't work like that, Raven. It's kind of like me and my wife and I. Our relationship is this. I... You know, I scratch her back, she scratches mine. I do for her, she does for me. If I fail to do for her, she fails to do for me. And I looked at him and I said, well, I don't want your relationship with your wife. And if you think that's what your relationship with God is, and I didn't know any, this has been 95, 1995 or something like that. And I, it hit me, man, is that relationship with God? That's not what I'm understanding to be a relationship with God. Because if it's up to me to scratch God's back, I can't reach that high. I can't. First of all, that says a lot about your relationship with your wife. Secondly, I don't want that kind of relationship with my wife, and I do not believe God has given me that type of relationship with himself, because he knows I don't have long enough arms to reach that high. I can't do that, and he knows that in capacity. <laughs> that is why it's by grace you are saved. <coughs> But we live by contract in Christianity, apparently. But the reality is, when you are born again, you come into the reality of covenant. A covenant that is in you, written in you, engraved in you by God's own power. Covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is basically a relationship. A relationship. This is the truth of a covenant. This is what actually governs the covenant that God is. This is what governed the covenant with, uh, with Israel under the old covenant, what we call, uh, this covenant was always governed right here. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God related to them, even in the giving of the law, it was a continuation of the covenant. You see that from Genesis 15, where we're going to go and stop. This may be a long class. This was the last class didn't come out right. The audio was bad. So this is a, that and a continuation. So it's going to be a little extended version. Uh, bear with me. This reality governed it. If you, when you go to Genesis 15, we'll see that. Even what he made with Israel as what we call the old covenant was still this covenant. God's only had one covenant eternally, and it's with his son. 
It's a relationship between the Father and the Son. That is why salvation is a relationship not with Raven and God, but God's own relationship with his Son being brought into the soul. That is Abba Father. That is the spirit of adoption. That's the spirit of this Son being now in my soul. Here it is. In my soul that's born again brought that son, that relationship, this whole thing. Father and I will come and we will make our abode in you. That's what he's saying. We will bring a covenant into you. This is Abba Father. This is relationship. It is him bringing into your soul an eternal fellowship, relationship, covenant. When you are born of God. When you are born of God, that's what happens. Your soul becomes a partaker of a covenant and your soul is sealed in the reality of the covenant because a covenant is not a contract. A covenant is this, a stronger party makes a covenant with a weaker party and that party that makes the covenant with the weaker party is sufficient in himself to make, to, to, to carry out the whole thing. He it, nothing depends on both parties holding their end of the bargain. It all depends upon the stronger party carrying out the thing. And the other is a beneficiary of that relationship. There are things expected, yes. But see, in the old covenant, the things expected were, were given to them under the guise of a covering called the law of Moses. That's why I say the law was truly the picture of the grace of God because he clothed them with a garment of, of, of ceremonies and, and functionality that kept them clothed with the garment of the, of the son himself. All of the sacrifices and offerings, the, the tabernacle, the priesthood, the, all the festivals, that all was him garbing them, clothing them with this testimonial picture so that he could relate to them in this relationship. So that what he expected, what, re, what the covenant demanded, he had provided. And as long as they stayed within the garment that he provided them, he would relate to them in son, as son. In the light of a son. In the light of sonship. The moment they stopped and ceased that, they, that Whatever refused to walk in the light in that garment and the reality of that garment was removed. Because covenant is father and son. Same as the new covenant, but much greater. Because now the covenant is the spirit of the son now dwelling in the soul, coming into the soul, the reality of covenant, bringing the soul into the true reality of covenant. This ongoing continual, unbreakable fellowship and covenantal relationship. That's what he has done and brought. It is him being in you all things, him being made unto you all things. This is reality because it is now this soul that had no capacity, this soul that was weak, this soul that was barren, now is gifted with the fruitfulness of covenant, the fruitfulness of, of, of union, the fruitfulness of relationship. The bounty of all spiritual blessings. Not because it has deserved any of it. Not because it has qualified for any of it. Not in that God is indebted to it. Because it could do nothing to get God to be indebted to it. But because God's love and grace and mercy that has created this soul for no other purpose. Now gives to that soul the very purpose for which it was created. And this is the reality of the covenant. Not to make the soul able to produce but be the full producing of all things into the soul or to the soul and bringing the soul into the full bounty of the reality of relationship with God, covenant with God. This is the power of it. Now, here's some statements that you may not like. And we're going to get into Genesis 15 in just a second. You already know, we, we've covered that before. You know this Picture very well. I want to show you something regarding the covenant and why we have to see the power of the covenant with regard to this. Why we have to understand the power of the covenant 
with regard to Romans 8 and 4, saying that what the law couldn't do, God has done, so that the thing that we could never achieve, look at Romans 7, impossible. Impossible. But in the receiving of Christ, in the receiving of the Spirit of life, He didn't give us the power to perform it. He performed it in us by his own power, through the gift of his own son, his own life. That's the power, the supreme sufficiency of covenant, a new covenant now written in the heart So much so that no man needs teach you. That means no man can bring you to this reality or bring you to the understanding of it. But God himself. So, let me read some of these verses or some of these statements. The intention of God within the heart of man. Now notice I say within the heart, the soul, the very inward parts of man is never to remedy our weakness. Never to remedy our weakness or to fix our incapacity. That's what we think salvation is. He's fixed me. He's made me better. No, the healing that that John talks about by his stripes we were healed is not physical. Yes, it is spiritual. But it is healing that we are brought from death unto life, from sin unto righteousness. But it never makes us the righteous ones. It never makes us holy. It makes him unto us holy. Which keeps us in a state of earthen vessels indwelt by a treasure. Of those who have been dependent upon life and are still dependent upon that life being present and made known. Not I but Christ. Not not me and Jesus. No, not I but Christ. That is not a healing of your weakness or a fixing of your insufficiency. That is a soul resting assured in the sufficiency of another who has all sufficiency, who has all power, who has all and is all in all. So, (coughs) excuse me. When I say that, I am referring to the weakness that is actually addressed in Scripture, a vertical weakness. We've addressed that. I use the word to merely paint a picture. When we are considering the achieving of acquiring or or the acquiring of divine reality, we are totally without power. Therefore, it is important that salvation is not the method by which God takes away these frailties and infirmities, that we possess as earthen vessels. We are earthen vessels indeed having a great treasure within. The treasure in scripture, read the verse, is synonymous with the term power and effectual supply. God has done this, as Paul writes, so that it is obvious that the exceeding reality is of God and by way of presence of the treasure and not of us at all. The surpassing excellency of his power is never fixed. And I mean this. It's not a temporary arrangement in us until we're able to carry out our part of of the responsibility. This is sufficient salvation of God and not of us. The weakness of the vessel is never fixed. It is divinely overridden by the perfect and efficacious strength of of the substance of another. Thus we can boast, rejoice, and glory in our infirmities because his strength is made perfect in the midst of our weakness. The absence of our incapacities regarding, again, spiritual attainment, the absence of our incapacity has never been and shall never be the measure of God's sufficiency within. You hear that? The absence of incapacity the absence of our weakness, the absence of our insufficiency has never been and will never be the true measure of God's sufficiency in us. You don't determine the one by seeing the other. Men do that. They point at it and say, look at it. See, that disqualifies you. And I wrote, unfortunately, we're always looking 
for the absence of our issues. Issues men will point to and they will preach as obstacles to achievement. This is why building our edifices upon the premise of what we yet comprehend, the external effects such understanding would produce. And I've seen this so many times. They, are, they, they believe that the seeing of something means the absence of all issues. The seeing of Christ means there's no more, there's no more issues, no more weaknesses, no more frailties, no more problems. That's, that's, that's it. Baloney. Paul had just had a revelation. That's why the thorn was in his flesh. He had just seen the third heaven, Christ revealed in him, and he still had this thing that he knew, man, I can't, I need this to be gone away. And the whole point is the revelation didn't remove the thorn. The thorn was given after. The revelation didn't remove it. Didn't remove issue. Didn't remove obstacle. What did? The sufficiency of grace. And it didn't remove it. But in the midst of it, it was sufficient. In the midst of it, it overcame. It surpassed all weaknesses. It surpassed every infirmity. It was his power. Performing within. What could not be performed without. Now that's a reality in which we should glory and make our boast in the Lord alone. So building our edifices upon the premise of what we yet comprehend is dangerous. Because it also is us putting our bets upon the external effects that we believe such understanding produces. Because listen to this statement. I want you to get this in your heart and your mind. Listen to this statement. We, the reason it's dangerous to to put all things and, and, and build everything upon what you understand is because we will never have the fullness of understanding. But we do presently have the fullness of Christ. We will never have the fullness of understanding. But we do presently have the fullness of Christ. You hear me? Understanding grows. God adds to it. God removes illusions and brings in realizations. He remains the same. That's the thing upon which everything should be built. We will grow in understanding. I remember God saying to me in Costa Rica many years ago, there will never, no matter how much of me you have seen, there will never be less of me to see. You see, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. And I say, Lord, lead me, guide me, and carry me on into this realm of perfect reality. But I must, in the midst of that, comprehend that it does not make the reality any more than it already is. The reality he is onward carrying me into and, 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 and showing me and making known and revealing in me and showing me this reality and that reality and the seeing of, my, of his beloved son, my life is that which has remained and been abiding within my soul in fullness since I was born again. To this statement, that we will never have the fullness of understanding, but we presently have the fullness of Christ, many will answer and say, yeah, uh, but I did not know anything of this salvation until God revealed his son in me and made known in my soul the reality of salvation. And to that I answer absolutely yes and amen. Absolutely. That is so true. But I have to add this as well. That while you and I did not know anything at all, ignorant as we could be, we were, however, fully known by God 
in reality. And it is upon that basis that he draws and he, and he, and he teaches and he makes known and he deals with my soul in the light of his understanding, not mine, because his understanding is the reality upon which I stand. So upon which of those two should or does the certainty of salvation rest? It is settled upon, is it settled upon the ever-growing, expanding realization taking place in us, or does it rest upon the sure and the steadfast rock who is the same yesterday, today, and forever? This is the reason Paul can pen such absolute, comprehensive statements regarding salvation. He can present substantial statements regarding the condition of our souls in Christ without having to back down or bend to caveats, conditions presented by those who appoint at men and say, that can't be so, just look at that, look at this. I speak to those of us who are watching right now, those of us who will watch and listen later, and I say this, if you are born again, I'm saying this to you. If what we are saying concerning Christ in us is true at all, it is true in all, and it is true of all. Not all men on earth, no, all who are born again, meaning there is not a level One above another. Not at all. The reality that Paul addresses is absolute, complete in him, all spiritual blessings, all of these things. If they are true at all. Why? Because he's the truth of it. He's the truth. Realization doesn't make him More true than he is. He's the truth. If he abides in this soul, which he does if you're born again, then there are no levels of truth and no levels of reality. So if it's true at all, it is true in all. And it's upon the truth that is in all that he calls us to understand. And I do realize That there, there is not the understanding of all, or all do not have the understanding of that which is true in all. I know that. And that's why the soul gifted with the riches of grace must behold the riches in the presence of the Son. So that what is true in all will be the ongoing comprehension and enjoyment of all in whom it is true. And what is it? It is the truth of the sufficient power of covenant, of relationship. That reality that has made him to be the righteousness of God in us. Made him to be the fulfilling of the righteousness of the law in us. Made him to be the completeness that we now possess as a condition, as a state of being. Missing nothing, lacking nothing. That's the covenant That's what the covenant provides. A stronger party has given to the weakness of the vessel everything required. Look, here's the the verses. Again, I'm sorry this is an extended version. I'm trying to bring us up to where we're going to go. So this is kind of dragging in a lot of things that we've said and going to get us upon a a basis to, to, to further further our uh, discussions here. Man, there's so many verses that we could look at. Galatians 4, 24 through 28. Well, let me, let me read this in Genesis first. Um, Genesis 15, verse 3. Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. That's all about that, a seed. And one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now to heaven and tell the stars if you are able to number them. 
And he said, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it unto him for righteousness. He had no answers, had a promise, and he knew his condition. (laughs) He knew his state. You're, you're going to be faced with it right on the heels of this beautiful picture of covenant cut. You're going to be faced with this ugly picture Abraham, when asking these questions, realized was there. I mean, he didn't understand it when he got to chapter 16. He lived it. He knew that he had a wife that was barren. He knew that he was, he was in that condition where his wife could bear him any children because she couldn't. Her womb was dead. God made a promise. God said it will be. And he believed. In the midst of his weakness, hoping against hope, Romans 4 will say. He believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness and Verse 7, and, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give thee this land. I did this. I, I implemented it. I started this. I began it. Not because you first loved him, but he first loved us, remember? I implemented this. I brought this about. And here's the question that all of this is going to answer. Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How is this going to all happen? How in the world would this be brought about? Again, he's asking understanding his actual situation of barrenness, weakness, incapacity. And so in verse 9 through whatever, uh, 9 and 10 and then even 11... God gives him these instructions to take a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he took all of them, divided them in the midst, laid each against another, and the birds he divided not. Again, this is why I say the covenant God gave with Israel, God only had one covenant eternally. You see it in picture here, but this is the picture of an eternal covenant being brought, uh, presented to Abraham. Showing him how is this going to happen? How, what, what power will actually be able to produce this? Cause I can't. My wife can't. Here's the answer. But look at these sacrifices that he makes, the animals that he kills. It shows you that the covenant with Israel was governed by this one covenant. One covenant governed the whole thing. Because these were the same animals that the old covenant used to sacrifice as well. Showing that the whole thing was governed by this. But see in the light of it the whole thing's governed right here in this covenant. This light. Father and son. Relationship. Eternal. Perfect. Unbreakable. Divine. So he does it. He does that. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abraham, he gives him now 400 years worth of a history concerning the seed that was going to come out of him and be, in, be, be slaves in a land of strangers for 400 years, and they're going to come out with great abundance. They're going to come in resurrection with great abundance, have riches, have all of the great abundance and substance. And then he tells him about him dying and going to his fathers at a ripe old age. But here's the, here's the point. The seed doesn't even exist yet. And he's given him this history of these things happening. How do they happen? What's the assurance of it? Not just him saying it. What's the assurance? It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. What is that? That's the cutting of a covenant. That's a covenant. God cutting a covenant with himself. As Hebrews will say, he could find no greater to swear by. He swore by himself. 
He did this himself. He shows you the power of it. It shows you the divine substantiality and sufficiency of it. He did it with himself. He didn't call Abraham over and say, take my hand, we're going to do this together. Absolutely not. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't look at us and say, I did my part, now do yours. I held up my end of the responsibility. Now you're responsible to carry out your part of it. What part could I actually ever carry out? I had to be by grace, by gift, by the mercy of God brought into this altogether. He had to actually orchestrate the whole thing. He had to instigate it. He had to bring it about. He has to reveal it. That's the reality of covenant. Not I, but Christ. In my weakness, he is strong. Now notice what happens here. Here's the thing. He brings now in the same day that he sees this cutting of the covenant with God himself, Father and Son. You actually see it in those two objects that walk between the pieces. Let's just say God himself, Father and Son, the reality of a relationship that's divine and eternal and unbreakable, a fellowship that is unbreakable, who already have a covenant within themselves, showing the covenant within themselves, the reality the cross would bring about that we could partake of through the work of that death, burial, and resurrection. All of that is is seen in this picture. And then in that same glorious day of that covenant, he brings Abraham into it. And says, unto thy seed have I given this land. How's it going to be done, God? I did it. It's done. It'll play out, but it's already finished. It's already done. Covenant. My covenant. My covenant makes it so. My covenant makes it reality. A new covenant I will make with you. In the soul. What makes it reality? What makes it real? What's gonna, how do I know this is real, God? I'm in you. <laughs> how do I know this is so? I'm in you. It's so because I'm the soul of it. Yeah, we come to comprehend it in the seeing of Him. Absolutely. But it is so in you because He's there. Presence determines it. Presence of Abba Father, the presence of covenant relationship makes it so undeniably and unbreakably, irreversible. But here's the here's the issue. Chapter sixteen slaps you in the face with a situation that hadn't changed. See, seeing all of this, you would think Abraham would come in and think, wow, she's going to be not barren anymore. I'm going to be able to have a child. She's not going to be barren anymore. Guess what? She's still barren. He's not getting any younger. And so he sees an alternative and you know what he does. Here's this dilemma. But God has already made covenant. The covenant has already made certain and made sure something. And he could point at himself and say, I can't. And God says, but I am. He could point at this picture and say, it's impossible. And he says, but with me, it is not only possible, it is performed. Romans 4 says, finally he come to who promised it is also able to perform it. That's the reality he saw here. But here's the issue. That's why I can say God doesn't heal your barrenness. It wasn't about him healing Sarah's barrenness or the later on making Abraham a teenager again so he's able to do the thing that God promised. No, God superseded it all. He overrode it all. He in his sufficiency, overcame the weaknesses of their insufficiency, their infirmity, to do what they could not, to bring about what they were incapable of bringing about. And that's the power of the new covenant. 
That's the power of the covenant of God made with the soul. He is in the soul. All that the soul was intended for, but could not produce. That's why you can have verses that says this. Which things are an allegory, Galatians 4, 24 through 28. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the, gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. And for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And we didn't even get into that. I mean, it shows you here, here's a covenant made with God. There's a covenant and it says now this thing cannot be nullified. This covenant, 430 years later, the law came, couldn't nullify this covenant. You see that picture in kind of a little microscopic testimony here. Hagar could not upset the reality. Hagar being the mother that is the old covenant, that, that picture in bondage with her children, the bondage of the old covenant, the bondage under Adam, all of that could not nullify the truth of the covenant made with Abraham, made with himself, first of all, but Abraham brought into reality that covenant. The Abraham's, the covenant God made was not, I'm going to make her not barren. It's she will have. I will come and she's going to have. In whom we have 